the question of oil development in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is sending a very clear message that there really aren't permanently protected areas. What we're up against is a mentality that puts money above everything else. This country imports one half of the oil we consume, eight million barrels a day. We spend $57 million to import oil. ANWR has to be part of that policy because if it isn't, this nation does not have an energy policy. If they're gonna do it up there, why don't they be honest and say, everything's open, it's so important to the country, we're starting to drill Yellowstone tomorrow. You don't know what wilderness is, except some yuppies come in here and say, oh, wouldn't it be great if we could set it aside for wilderness? Now that's who you're talking about, setting aside Alaska for, the very, very wealthy of the United States. It seems, Mr. Chairman, that what you would like is a risk-free environment, either from nature or from man, and you're never going to achieve that. Man probably can control the environment a little better than nature apparently does. It is unfortunate that we're still having this discussion about whether to develop the 1002 area uh, in, in Alaska. I, and I know what I'm talking about. The I Arctic agree. Plain is really nothing. You say it's not the heart. It is not the that. heart. It is not the heart. But the reality is this area should be drilled. I've been fighting this battle for 39 years. We have a, uh, we've got a battle in front of us. The fight is on and we are not backing down. You environmentalists always portrayed as Anwar out there as, uh, as beautiful as Colorado with the mountains and everything and the vistas and this and that. But in actuality, what you are talking about is tundra, known in most parlance as wasteland. There's nothing out there. It's a virtual plain. As far as the eye can see, there's nothing out there. We are raised to protect the area. To us, it's not work, it's livelihood. It's, you know, who we are, it's our life. And um, like some people would call it activism, but we're just trying to protect our way of life. This is a People magazine from 1989, and um, this is our traditional chief. Alaska's which in Indians have lived undisturbed for 10,000 years. Now America's energy needs threaten the tribe's survival. Um, I went to a summit and they were all like, the Gwich Inn been standing up to one of the biggest governments in the world for 28 years and there's, a, there's what, 8,000 of us. Honestly, I'm not the same person I was when I started. The Western world really took a huge impact on a lot of us and I wasted a lot of time and it's time for me to do my part. Um, that's the coastal plain. That's the sacred area to us. That's where we have always been told to protect by our elders. And what are the red dots to the left? These are where they're drilling. I don't know if people really understand the history of the Alaska Native people with our government. I didn't speak Gwich'in growing up because my mother was hit for speaking it, and she didn't think that it meant much. That generation was told to be ashamed of everything that makes us who we are, of our, of, of our beliefs, of our language, of the way we eat and what we eat. Nationwide, Native Nationwide, Native Sands side by side. Gotta stop the Jones and the caribou. That's what it's all about. I lost my brother to suicide in 2006, February 7th. So then um, I started, like I drank every single day. I, I don't know, I just went down the wrong path. From there, I just kind of just lost myself and I wasn't always a good mom. And 
I just feel like me, I'm doing this also for them in a big, huge way. And I just feel like I gained their respect back. My mother and my grandparents, you know, despite having gone through everything that they went through, they did instill in myself and my brothers a, such a strong sense of be proud of who you are and who we are, are beautiful people. The Gwich'in gathering is that time that we as a Gwich'in nation get to unite and we get to address the issues that we're facing and to know that it's okay, you're going to fall down, but we're gonna be here to help you stand back up. Creator, thank you for this beautiful blessed day. Thank you for all the love and beauty in our lives. I just ask that you bless our travels and all of our relatives that are traveling um, by boat and by air, and that you bring a sense of peace and calm to us as we travel. Uh, we look forward to the smiles and the laughter and the sense of peace of celebrating this life, of celebrating our connection and our relationship to the land and ancestors. And we just ask that you alleviate any anxiousness or nervousness that we might have to be present in the moment and to truly enjoy this experience of life. Just coming back, you just remember, everything just comes back. It's just like your heart starts beating again. The Gwich'in Nation uh, came together in 1988, and our people hadn't gathered like that for over 100 years. And that urgency for that meeting to happen was the question of oil development in the 1002 section of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which is the coastal plain. At that meeting, they decided that for certain, our fate is tied to the health um, and well-being of the porcupine caribou herd, and that we've had this spiritual relationship for thousands of years, and that we had to stand strong on protecting this place. My name is Sarah James, and I'm a Gwich'in Athabascan from Arctic Village, Alaska. I'm here on behalf of all my Gwich'in people with the direction of our elders. For too many and too long, this has been an issue of environment versus energy, and no one wanted to hear about the Gwich'in. We used to be tucked away, way up north, in no, no man's land, until this threat of the development came to our attention, that we have to come forward and say this part of the world is special to us. We're always been here, never came from anywhere. We're not going anywhere, we're here to stay. We need people to go out and educate the world. We need to choose people right here, right now, that's gonna do that for us. We, as Gwich'in people, need to find our traditional culture again. And we, we've always been told that what befalls the caribou befalls the witch in. There have been times where I have broke down crying, walking those hard marble floors in Washington, D.C., because we shouldn't even have to be fighting 
for our human rights in this manner. Our community very much depends upon that herd to this day, just as we have for thousands of years. And so it's a human rights issue. It's a food security issue for the Gwich'in communities, for the Gwich'in nation. And that is why we have um, been so forthright over a 30 year period of time now, trying to protect this place. The porcupine caribou herd goes there to have their calving grounds. That's when their next generation comes. Every spring, the porcupine caribou go up there, and within a two-week period of time, they're gonna have up to 40,000 calves on that area. And that's a miracle. That's a huge deal. Um, and as a woman, I know what it's like to give birth, to bring another being into this world. And um, we need a refuge. There is a spiritual element to this. There is that spiritual foundation. There's something else at stake here that maybe we can't see. If you take me to the city and you think I'm going to survive, I, don't, I wouldn't know how to survive. I can't go into the store and hunt. I don't have no money to buy anything. What we're up against is a mentality that puts money above everything else. The symbolism of getting into a place like the coastal plain of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is you are sending a very clear message that there really aren't permanently protected areas because at the end of the day, we need to make money and we need that oil. And that is not true. That is something that's been sold to us and that we keep believing. Carry this fire and take it home to your own community. It didn't start now, it started thousands of years ago. I don't want my kids to lose who they are. I don't, well, I don't want to lose who I am. The domino effect on the opposite end is that we start losing this battle and how we view the world. It's an indigenous worldview versus this very Western view of, of our Mother Earth and what these resources are there for. When times get hard for me, I remember that I have a whole nation of people that are depending on me. And so giving up is not an option. I feel like I failed my people. That's the last thing I want to do. It's not always easy, like, it scares me, and I want to be able to tell my kids that I've done everything I could for them. I don't want them to ask me later on down years ahead when, you know, the drastic changes start happening. And they ask me, Mom, what did you do when you could have done something? Did you do anything? I want to be able to say yes. I want you to imagine you wake up because your phone's buzzing because you're getting 31 text messages. And it's the, the 1002, this one's Claire, a national monument. What is that going to feel like? <laughs> Gwich'in Nation from Alaska, the Yukon, and the Northwest Territories at the 14th Biannual Gwich'in Gathering hereby declare that we will come together in unity, strength, and leadership to address the issues facing our people. We assert our inherent right to govern ourselves as a Gwich'in Nation. We must stand strong in our identity, the foundation of which is the caribou.
we will stand together and encircle our vision of the future and ensure its delivery into the world through our youth.